Lecture 7, Work Design and Measurement. So one consideration when we're designing work is specialization. So with specialization you get some efficiencies and what specialization means is, is work that concentrates some aspect of a product or service into one area. So in our burrito making example, the, the person who's at the beginning of the line making burritos, they always stay at the beginning of the line. And they get really good at that part. The person at the cash register always stays at the cash register. They specialize in the cash register. So the advantages um, for management is it simplifies training. Once you've trained someone in that area, you don't have to keep training them. And there's high productivity um, and there's low wages. They don't have to know very much. They can keep their wages the way it is. The disadvantage for uh, oh, the advantage for employees is low education and skill requirements. They have minimum responsibility and little mental effort. They just mindlessly do their job. So there's disadvantages of specialization too. For management, it's difficult to motivate quality. So the person there is just doing the same thing over and over and they don't really have the big picture of if they make a little mistake here and it gets put in and it it's way down the line it's it's that concept of quality can be hard and you can have a problem with worker dissatisfaction uh, more absenteeism higher turnover disruptive tac uh, tactics poor attention to quality, all of those are disadvantages. For employees, the disadvantages is the work can become monotonous really fast. You have little opportunities for advancement, a little control over the work, and little opportunity for self-fulfillment. So there's some things you can do that are behavioral approaches to job design. So one is job enlargement. And this is giving a worker a larger portion of the total task by horizontal loading. So if you, if you think of this, this line that has four stations, job enlargement is they start out with station one and then they move to station two and then they get so good at those two that they start doing station one and two. So that's job enlargement. It's horizontal loading. Job rotation, and that's where you, you might have four stations and the, the employees rotate from station one to station two, station three, station four. And that the, the good thing with that is when you have that really hard station, everybody takes a turn at that hard station. Job enrichment is different than job enlargement, and that is where you have more responsibility for planning and coordinating tasks. This is like vertical loading. So in other words, the person at station one may decide when everybody's going to rotate or may help plan who's going to be at what station when. That, that would be a job enrichment. Quality of work life. So the quality of work life not only affects the worker's overall sense of well-being and contentment, but it also can um, increase their productivity. So there's different aspects of quality of work life how a worker gets along with co-workers. So you can have a really great boss, but you don't like any of the people that you work with, and that's lower quality of work life. Another quality of work life is the management. If you have a great boss, that, that, that helps uh, give better quality of work life. Working conditions, what are you in, or is, is the, are you working in the kitchen where it's really hot? 
Are you outside during the winter or the summer? Is it a really noisy place? Can you concentrate? Those kinds of things. And then compensation. There's, there's the real compensation like your, your pay, but then there's the, the less, the other compensations. Do you have health insurance? Do you get paid time off? How much trouble are you in when you're sick? Can you get actually, when you request vacation time, do they actually give you those days off? So there's different compensation approaches. One is time-based. So this is a time-based compensation is you, you're paid by the hour. So the advantage for this for management is you know what your labor costs are. You're paying people $10 an hour. Uh, you have this many people. This is how much your labor cost is. It's really easy. Every week, people fill out time cards. They turn it in. It's simple to compute pay. And you just have stable output. For the worker, you, you know what you're going to get paid. My paycheck, I know what my paycheck is. It's the same every, every month. And there's less pressure to produce um, than under an output-based system. So the disadvantages for management, there's no incentive for workers to increase output. Uh, there's no financial incentive. And the extra efforts for the worker is not rewarded. So then there's outputs-based compensation. So this is where you're, you're paid by piece part. So for everything that you build, you're paid so much per item. So the good part is you can end up with a lower cost per unit and greater output. So if I'm getting paid to build widgets and I get a certain amount per widget, I'm going to start um, doing more and more and more. And so from that, the, the advantage for the worker is they are earning more money because as they get more efficient, they earn more money. And the harder they work, the, the more money they get. So the difficult or disadvantages for management is it can be difficult to, to calculate the wage wages. You have to actually measure the output and quality may suffer. If I'm if I if I want to try to get 10 out and I'm having a problem with uh, problem with it. It's like I'm, I'm in a hurry and I just get it done. Um, and it's, it's hard to get to incorporate wage increases. You give, give someone, okay, it's a 2% cost of living. How, what does that mean? And you have potential scheduling problems. So as one person is going really, really fast, the next person in the line is going slow, and, and those kind of things. For the worker, the disadvantages are your pay goes up and down. Uh, so one, one week you're feeling great and you get a whole bunch done. That The next week is just a bad week for you and you don't feel very good. So you don't feel very good. You don't get very much done. And, and on top of not feeling very good, you get a lower paycheck. And then the other problem is the workers could be penalized for back factors beyond their control. So you're supposed to be working on this machine. The machine breaks down. It's not your fault. Suddenly you're not making any money because you're waiting for the person who's coming to fix the machine. Uh, you could be going really fast, but you're, de you're on station three really fast, but you're dependent on output from station two. So you're standing there waiting for station two to deliver something to you so that you can go really fast. So that's beyond your control. So analyzing the jobs. So this is something called a flow process chart. And it's used to examine the overall sequence of an operation. So here's an example where you're getting a requisition for out of petty cash. So here you start out, the requisition is made out by the department head. So that's in operations. 
it goes to a pickup basket. So the pickup basket is a delay. It goes to the accounting department. So that's movement. And then the account um, and signature verified. So you verify that they're inspecting it. And then it's approved by the treasurer. You're actually doing something. Counted by the cashier. Recorded by the bookkeeper. Petty cash sealed in an envelope. And then the cash is carried to the department. The cash is checked against the requisition. The receipt is signed. And the petty cash is stored in a safety box. So there's storage. So you see the different things are are categorized. There's operation where you're doing something, movement where it's moving, inspection where you're checking it. Uh, there's a delay and then the storage. So you could do this with a lot of different jobs where you just, just go through the job and just map out what happens. And then there's a worker machine chart. And this is where a worker is interacting with a machine. And you can measure the time that the worker is busy or the equipment is busy. So here is the example where someone is weighing food. So it's a customer who weighs food on a little box that dispenses the, the, the price sticker. So here the, the customer places the item on the scale, they enter a product code, and then the machine calculates and displays the price and dispenses a price sticker. Uh, the customer obtains the price sticker and removes the bag and places the price sticker on the bag. So that's sort of a process there. The total time here is uh, uh, eight seconds. So it's eight seconds of time there, and you can look here. The work time is seven seconds where the customer is wor working. They're waiting for one second. The machine is working one second and waiting seven seconds. So that's a, a worker machine chart. Work measurement techniques. So how do you measure work? So one, one way is a, a stopwatch time study. And so what you do is it's a time standard based on observations of one worker taking over cycles. So, so an example is every minute, you, you stand there all day and every minute you write down what that person is doing. So, or every hour, what are they doing? And then there's something called standard elemental times. And that is, we know that it normally takes this amount of time to do this task. So, and we've, we've derived that. You can actually get uh, tables where it says this is how long it should take to do this kind of work. So it's often from the firm's historical study data. And then um, predetermined time standards. And this is the published one. So standard elemental times are the, the firm's own. Um, this predetermined time is out of a book or something like that. And then work sampling. And then this is where you estimate the portion of time that a worker or machine spends various activities in idle time. Learning curve. So we use the term learning curve all the time, but a lot of us don't even know what it means. So, so here's a graph of a learning ter term. And on the, the, the scale here is time per repetition and the number of repetitions. So the, the concept of learning curve is the time required to perform a task decreases with increasing repetitions. And so short routine tasks show modest improve, a modest improvement, longer, more complex task will show improvement over a longer interval. So there's interesting characteristics of learning curve. The learning curve effect is predictable. The learning curve percentage is constant. The concept is every doubling 
of repetitions results in a constant percentage decrease in the time per repetition and typical decrease range from 10 to 20 percent. So here's an example of learning curve. So um, the first unit took a hundred uh, hours. The second unit or the next two units took 90 hours each. The next four units took 81 hours each. Next eight units took 72 hours each. And so you see that the units are doubling and these are being reduced. There's a 10% reduction, uh, another 10% reduction, another 10% reduction, and it's, it's going down by about 10% each time. So that's, that's an example. So the applications. So this is useful in manpower planning and scheduling. So if you got a major project and you're going to start rolling out a new product, you know that the first few are going to take longer, but as you go on, you're going to go down the learning curve and it's, and it's going to get better. Negotiated purchasing. So when you're purchasing small quantities or a new product, you could say, well, the first ones are more expensive, but then as you go down the learning curve, we should be able to get a cheaper price. When you're pricing new products, you might measure, measure something and say, well, it took us 10 minutes to build this product. Well, you know that as you're going down the learning curve, you can, you can say, well, if I'm doing 100, how long is that going to take? or a thousand and and you can estimate those numbers based on the learning curve uh, budgeting purchasing inventory planning all of those uh, can have learning curve applications and capacity planning so as you know as the learning curve is going down you're going to be able to get more out of that capacity so this lecture we've talked about job design quality of work life, different methods of analysis, emotion study, work measurement, and finally learning curves.